Um, starting with Padmaja, maybe you could introduce yourself. Sure, happy to. Uh, first of all, uh, delighted to be here and Bahrain, great hosting, great event. Thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Padmaja, as uh, Srini said. I'm a co-founder of Indian Angel Network. It is perhaps uh, the world's largest angel investor group. We have investors from 12 countries and we do about 25 to 30 investments a year. Uh, we've given an IRR of over 32% across 104 companies and we are sector agnostic, 17, 18 sectors. So that's what we do. And I'm also on the, the co-chair of Global Business Angel Network, which is obviously one of the GEN initiatives. So delighted to be here. Yeah, good afternoon. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my, my name is Yaduvendra Mathur. Uh, I work uh, for a government think tank called the National Institution for Transforming India. And uh, we are a think tank. We used to be earlier the planning commission. but. Uh, when our Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, uh, he, you know, really thought through uh, the need for, uh, you know, real change and uh, the, that is transformation. So one of the big assignments that my agency does is to create the uh, innovation ecosystem in India, along with the other line ministries. So we are running what we call the Atal Innovation Mission. And uh, that is supporting uh, about 6,000 schools with uh, tinkering labs, you know, and we'll talk about that more. So the I, I'm in this forum uh, representing that organization. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jayesh Ranjan. I work for the Indian province of uh, Telangana, Telangana government. Many of you would be familiar with its uh, capital city, Hyderabad. I look after the IT and uh, industries portfolios. And uh, I also uh, oversee the entire uh, range of uh, smart, uh, smart cities and startups and innovation entrepreneurship programs. See, all of you would be aware that India is a federal country. There are 29 provinces. So I'll be bringing a state's pro perspective, a province's perspective on what happens from the bottom up, bottoms up in the startup uh, innovation ecosystem. Hi, guys. My name is Yatin Thakur. I am an entrepreneur and uh, the country head for uh, Gen in India. Uh, I've been leading uh, entrepreneurship development activities across the country, uh, be it from uh, supporting grassroots uh, entrepreneurs to get started with their ideas to uh, finally uh, working actively closely with the government in ensuring the right policies are formulated and implemented. So happy to have you guys today with us. And my name is uh, Srinivas Kalipara. I'm a a co-founder of Gen India. Um, I'm also on the board of Gen Space and a couple of other things. Uh, currently running a fund. Uh, but actually, the, the point of this session today was to talk about how is it that you build an ecosystem. Now, one of the things that I've heard from a bunch of people who are not part of the regular um, group that we in interact with is that this word ecosystem is thrown about very easily. And it doesn't really mean a lot to people. What we're here to show is that actually ecosystem does mean something. Um, and how do you impact it at a country level is that you have to involve every stakeholder. So ecosystem just means how do you involve the different stakeholders that all are um, working around helping startups to scale. Everybody in this room is involved in this in some form. What we're trying to showcase is that as a country, India has been really focused on this over the last five years and has done a pretty good job, I would say, of building this ecosystem such that today we're the second largest startup ecosystem in the world, whereas just a few years ago we were way down the rankings. It's been done by many people coming together, and this, this uh, session panel is a representation of that. We have central government, we have state government, we have investors, we have ground up organizations, and we have uh, people that build ecosystems at the top level. All of these pieces need to work hand in hand. So what we're going to do is try and highlight a little of what each of these guys have done and how we've built them all together. Because usually what happens is everybody's working in silos. Investors are doing their thing. Governments are doing their thing. Uh, incubators are doing their thing. How do you bring it all together? So maybe we could start with uh, top down, as we said. From the central government level, 
Mr. Mathur, maybe you could mention some of the activities that have happened at the government level uh, to build the, the, the structure to help create an environment for this to happen. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, recognizing that, you know, for a country and for an economy uh, of our size, uh, there is uh, clearly in, in a very cl clear purpose at the highest levels in the government of India that we need to create a very strong, supportive ecosystem for the startups. And that was, for the last five years, that has been the driving mantra. That has been the key uh, for creating the entire facilitation for, uh, for the startups. Initially, we were trying to encourage uh, some in innovations uh, to be there, uh, but now we further uh, relax that so we have a very facilitating structure and you can register online as a startup and uh, it's all it can be done very quickly and once you get your registration done online uh, then you are eligible for a whole slew of of uh, benefits uh, and uh, uh, the the key the key thing that the government is trying to do is to get you uh, the in in a country of size the markets are large but the competition is also ruthless and brutal. So we're trying to uh, mentor and handhold uh, by engaging with the state governments. Like my colleague mentioned, it's 29 states, uh, a, a country with, uh, with challenges of its own. And we're also looking at in government, the municipal bodies, the, the village communities, the federal government, the tax authorities. Here we have 600,000 schools. So in a phased manner, each of the schools in India will have this uh, so a 3D printer, robotic kits, uh, the whole uh, length, you know, even sixth class onwards, the students getting exposed to cutting edge technology. So this is not a part of their curriculum, but the joy of and the, and the excitement of working with these has been a massive revolution. So uh, as we speak, uh, there are public sector which have got these, we call them tinkering labs. The, the, the entire data banks, so I don't want to bore you with that data, but 20,000 startups registered. Uh, truth is, we have opened up the lending portals available, the, uh, the, the facilitation is available. What we are really looking at. Uh, the incubators that have been funded by, by the government and you know, so the various agencies. Space missions, and so we are using cutting edge. Uh, best-in-class technology to deliver on the social challenges my country faces. And uh, we are very sure that with the uh, triangulation of the bank accounts, data, so I think the ecosystem is so fertile that the private sector, the young entrepreneurs, the old entrepreneurs, any age, uh, uh, India is the happening place and the government is completely committed to supporting the strengthening of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So one of the things that um, I find heartening about the India story, uh, especially when it comes to the central government initially, is that in a lot of early stage countries, what happens is governments run their own programs and they are not connected to the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of their country's ecosystem is what I mean. In this case, what the government has done is focus on things that only the government can do. So for example, tinkering labs, labs at schools, as you said, in mass scale, to just get children playing with emerging technology and get them enlightened on that. Uh, incubators that help entrepreneurs to start getting mentorship, etc. And then of course, they're actually listening to the rest of us over here on what's needed in terms of policy so that uh, tech startups can scale. So it's been incredible to work with central government um, recently and see what they're all doing. But I'd like to take this conversation to uh, Mr. Ranjan, who is the principal sector of industries and IT for the state of Telangana. So in India, we have a federal system. Um, you have the, the state, uh, central governments at the top, 29 state governments. So what they do is they dovetail onto stuff that's happening at the center. But in many cases, state governments can lead the way. And I think in many ways, Telangana has been doing that. So Jesh, maybe you could talk about some of the initiatives you've done to support uh, startups in Telangana. Sure. So uh, <clears throat> As Mr. Mathur said, there are a large number of uh, national programs, national policies. But the beauty of India is that uh, state governments also enjoy lots of autonomy in designing their own programs and fixing their own priorities. So 
much before uh, the Startup India program in uh, Delhi was introduced, our state had already embarked on a program to work with startups, to encourage startups. So I'll, I'll step back for a minute and give you a little bit of a background about Telangana. Uh, as everyone said, India has 29 states and Telangana is the youngest state of the country. It got, got into existence just about five years ago in June uh, 2014. And uh, right from day one, literally, a decision was taken that if this state has to really march ahead, really leapfrog ahead, it has to work very, very closely with startups. So I recall something very amusing. After the state government uh, took position, we, at that time, Hyderabad had around roughly 200 startups. So we gathered all of them in a room like this and asked them that what kind of help do you require from the government? And the answer was, unanimous answer, that if you stay away from us, <laughs> that is the best help we can get from you. But we also realized that there is a reason from where these kind of answers are coming because typically, Working with the government also brings into too much of micromanagement and over-regulation and so on and so forth. But we were clear that if uh, strategically if we support this, uh, uh, the startups and help them create an enabling uh, ecosystem, that will go a long way and that will be very, very valuable. And in the last five years, this is precisely what we have done. So we actually asked them that what are your pain points? And uh, in Hyderabad, for example, where most of the concentration of startups is, one of the biggest pain points which was identified by the startups was that they don't have uh, access to affordable space in the heart of the tech community. See, those of you who are familiar with Hyderabad, there's an enclave which is called Cyberabad, and that is where all the action is, all the top uh, IT companies, the knowledge-based institutions, the tech schools, the business schools, they're all located. But because of the fact that it is such a buzzing uh, uh, neighborhood, the rentals are very, very high. And obviously for a startup to afford those kind of rentals will be very difficult. So obviously they get pushed away to farther, to re more remoter locations. And they, in that process, they become, they become cut off from this kind of a happening uh, uh, activities. So the government decided that, okay, we will create a large space, a large incubator, and we will subsidize it for startups to operate from here. And uh, today in Hyderabad, I feel very proud to share this with you that the country's uh, largest tech incubator, it is called T-Hub. And Srinivas used to be the CEO of, of uh, that till uh, very recently. That is uh, up and running. It is a 70,000 uh, square feet facility, which can host about uh, 800 people. And uh, after we built it, we didn't realize that there is so much of appetite for high quality space, affordable space of this kind. And within weeks, it got filled up. And now what our government has done is, that we are building the second phase of T-Hub, which is five times bigger than the first phase. What we have built is already the biggest in the country. What is coming now, hopefully by the end of this year, will perhaps be amongst the biggest in the world. It will be a 350,000 square feet of space with uh, provision for 4,000 people to operate from there. But that is not the only problem that we address. I mean, we have addressed... <laughs> Thank you. But we have tried to address uh, other issues also. So for instance, another challenge which the startups uh, shared with us was that they find acquiring their first customer to be very, very difficult because it's so competitive and obviously for a startup to go around the market and acquire the first customer. So in our policy, we are amongst the first states to come up with a dedicated policy on startups and innovation. The state government has uh, assured that if a startup has a product or a service which is of relevance to the government, then we will procure it bilaterally. I mean, typically, if you have to participate in a government procurement process, it is very complicated. You have to come through a bidding process, and most likely, the startup will not even be eligible to participate in that bid because you won't have a track record, you won't have uh, serviced any large customers so far. So we have done away with all these uh, procurement rules, and we have procured bilaterally solutions, products, services from startups, if they are of relevance to the government. And I again feel very proud to share this with you that uh, in the last four and a half years or so, we have procured at least three dozen products and services from homegrown startups just through bilateral discussions, without any procurement process, without any bidding and so on. And thereby, the doors of the bigger market have got open because they've acquired the first customer. So. These are some of the multiple things which uh, a government can always encourage, the government can always facilitate. And uh, today, 
we have uh, spread much beyond uh, the capital city of Hyderabad. We have uh, today the largest number of uh, incubators and co-working spaces for a city in India. There are 43 of them so far, and the number uh, continues to grow. So we have created a state innovation cell, which in some ways standard standardizes the processes and approaches in all these uh, co-working spaces and, and the incubators. We have started uh, going to the smaller towns and uh, uh, tier two cities, as they are called, where we are doing a very thorough uh, process of identifying innovators, potential uh, entrepreneurs from the colleges, from amongst the community. Uh, Mr. Mathu spoke about the uh, tinkering lab. One of the things which uh, we have also focused on, that while we are creating amazing infrastructure for the startups in Hyderabad, we also have a responsibility to create the pipeline. And uh, the pipeline obviously needs to come in a large uh, measure from the colleges and schools. So uh, in Hyderabad uh, and uh, around, there are almost uh, 200 uh, professional colleges. And uh, we found that most of these colleges have uh, very little, the students that is, have very little uh, understanding on how, what it takes to become a successful entrepreneur. So we are creating entrepreneurship cells in these colleges, guiding the faculty on taking that responsibility to motivate the students. Typically in an engineering college, the students are required to do a project in their third year for a four year program. And uh, what we had seen in the past was that most of this uh, project reports were seen as a formality. You prepare something, you submit. The faculty doesn't demand any quality. The student also just sees this as a paper where I just get some pass marks and that is good enough. But what we have done is that we have encouraged these colleges and the students to start looking at these uh, college projects as an opportunity to get, a f get your first taste of entrepreneurship. So what we do is to tell them that you use this uh, college project and convert it, try to convert it into a business plan. Of course, it will not be a great business plan which too much of refinement and all, but the process of creating a business plan or developing a business plan, you get some exposure to it and those of them who show an aptitude and flair, flair for it, they are kind of encouraged to get into an incubator formally. So multiple ways in which, uh, as I said, said, the governments can very strategically support the startup world. And uh, as I said, five years ago when we started, we just had two incubators and uh, 200 startups. And today, we have almost uh, 2,000 plus startups, 43 incubators, and programs running across the length and breadth of the province. So I think one, one of the things that is quite amazing about what the Telangana government did is that governments tend to be doing a lot of different things to, to make large impact. And I think they did a few unique things. One was focus. It, although you want to impact your entire country and your entire state, it's not easy to do right at the beginning. You actually need to learn what problems you're trying to solve. And so one of the first things that they did was actually create T-Hub, the company that I worked for earlier, as an independent not-for-profit, working side by side with the government. And so the government has certain, um, a certain direction that it's trying to take its state. The not-for-profit actually works to pr push it in that direction, and then that's taken out further. So one of the things you didn't mention, Jesh, is the fact that T-Hub came in and transformed Hyderabad first, and then you created a whole bunch of other organizations to look after different pieces. Uh, so there's a, a We Hub for Women, for example, and there's a, a task for skilling. Um, there's rich. a rich there's an for institution research. called Rich, which promotes uh, collaborative research between yep. corporates, research hardware. institutions, and uh, startups, of course. Yep. And the hardware one as well. T uh, Works. Which is also building the largest prototype, I think. And the idea was rather than trying to do everything in one go, focus, do one thing, and then scale that. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you, Padmajak, from the Angel Investment Network, you've been in this for a while now. How have you seen the Indian ecosystem change over the last 10 years? So, you know, as I was listening to Mr. Mathur and Mr. Ranjan, the thoughts that were coming to my mind, how, um, how quickly has India changed? You know, I mean, India was actually a colony and then it adopted a socialist economy. And then when in the early 90s, when it liberalized, I think the entrepreneurial genes of India just unleashed. And it created the first industry in India, which was completely first generation, which is the IT industry. 
And while it created an industry which is now close to 200 billion or more, rather 225 billion, I think it had a much bigger impact. It had an impact of actually building, rebuilding India's self-confidence. It created a new generation of entrepreneurs, people who were middle class and first generation who could do it from garage to IPO. So we had Infosys with Narayan Murthy, we had um, a lot of them, you know, we had T, uh, um, NASCOMs, many of the founding members like uh, Saurabh, Srivastava, we had Jerry Rao, all of these were first generation entrepreneurs who created industries. Then we had the next wave with Sanjeev Pichandani created Nokri, which is India's largest portal and now the consumer internet company with a stable of unicorns sitting there. You had the Make My Trip with Deep Kalra and then you had the later. So, you know, what it did is actually unleashed a whole generation after generation of entrepreneurs. And I think that created a completely new India for us, completely new, very confident, can handle anything to be honest, build the new India, cater to what Mr. Mathur was saying a bit earlier to focus on the needs and gaps that we have and we have many challenges and we have many problems to address those. And remember, we not only have challenges in terms of infrastructure or healthcare or education, we have another very big challenge. We are a sixth of the world's population. And we are not 29 states, but we are 29 countries put together. Because each state is a different behavior, has a different customer behavior, has different needs, has different weather conditions, everything, terrain, everything. So how it works in a very uh, synchronized manner as a federal government is really something which is very amazing. And when we look at it from the angel investment perspective, actually for us, that was the opportunity. You know, create this, this created the very fertile ground for entrepreneurs and startups to breed. It created a confidence level which we had never seen before. There were the challenges which were actually opportunities. And they, they are umpteen of them. So it began with the IT industry, I must say that. It moved from services to products. But today, I think the virus of entrepreneurship has gone right across all sectors. So we would have it in, we have entrepreneurs across the board, agri, cybersecurity, education, healthcare, you name it, and there's a virus of entrepreneurship you see there. And interestingly, what it has done, India has done something which is, which is just phenomenal. It has taken IT, moved it from being a vertical to a horizontal. So it actually empowers and enables startups to start very quickly, to create ventures which can scale very rapidly at a low cost and catering to different customer behaviors. I think that is not possible in any most other countries around the globe. And, and we've seen many countries, I don't think that works. This is something which is really unique that we've seen in India. And for investors, this is absolutely the, it's, it's like ready-made, it's like manna from heaven, because suddenly you can see a very different kind of companies emanating, you see different kind of entrepreneurs who breed, you build models which are very dif different. Look at, look at some of the stats, and I'm just going to give you two stats. Which country, today India has Uran, which is a unicorn, which came up in literally two years. I haven't seen that happen in any country. You look at Nokri, which is the stable of unicorns today. It has Zomato, it has policy bazaars, and it, of course, itself is a unicorn. You don't see this very often. And the quality of companies, these are not fly-by-night. These are big, huge, sustainable, building, growing companies which are disrupting behavior, which are disrupting customer behavior across the strata, not in just one economic strata and I think that's what really excites us as angels. So what we did at, at IEN is we started getting business plans and we started as a small very local group but unfortunately we are still Indian right and it's just not possible for us to not think scale. So we said hey this doesn't work and we created a platform so that investors from not only around the country but now from around the world can invest in startups on our platform. And everybody has real-time information, 
equal rights to participate, help the companies, and they have to help the companies beyond just writing a check. So we literally institutionalize what angels should be doing, and which is the genetics, is to bring money, mentoring, and market access into an operational model. And that has really worked for us because we've now invested in about 150 companies and our companies are literally giving us an IR out of over 32, 33% and a failure rate of only about 15%, which is the reverse that you would see in most other startup ecosystems. And I think this is what I think mentoring and helping companies is so much more important than just money. The second piece which has happened in the last five years is startups have become almost the go-to career option. There doesn't seem to be any other option. There were no startups before 2014 or 2015 rather. You never heard about them. Now we have Economic Times, you'll have Times of India, all the major publications, center spreads full of startups. That's the big change that has happened in five years. On January 16th, 2016, which was the startup when the Prime Minister of India announced the startup day, it was completely a paradigm shift on how people in the country thought about startups, how they engaged, and how the fear of failure completely diluted. And I think that's very important. Because when you go entrepreneurial, there is bound to be failure. When we invest, there is bound to be failure. It's a given. You have to accept that. And I think that is where the government and whatever it did in creating not only an enabling ecosystem, which Mr. Mathur and Mr. Ranjan spoke about, but I think at a much higher level of creating a culture of accepting failure, a culture of startups, a culture of risk investment, which is angel investing. When we started 12 years ago, there was no angel investing. We brought it into the country. Today, angel investing is sitting as a, established itself in H&I portfolios. In fact, we are talking to the government to say, how can the next level of wealthy people get into this? And I think this is the big change that has happened. Further that we've done, and I think I must take this opportunity to actually talk about it, though it's a little beyond angel investing, but the government and I think the ecosystem together has created sources of funds for startups to then access more money as they grow. So we have the fund of funds, which is 10,000 startups, which is about what? One and a half billion. 10,000 crores. 10,000 crores, which is about a one and a half billion. One and a half billion dollars. Billion dollars available, right? And it's opening up, banks are opening up, institutions are opening up, family offices are opening up, all sorts of organizations are opening up. But importantly, overseas companies and corporates and organizations are looking at India right now. And I think they are starting to put in money and I think that is very, very important because of two reasons. Number one is India has created itself literally the market of opportunities for young companies to grow very rapidly and scale, number one. And number two, some of the things that Mr. Mathur and Mr. Uh, Mr. Ranjan were alluding to, it's created a very conducive environment for investors and entrepreneurs to actually build companies. And therefore, what we did, we took a little bit of an advantage of this entire change that has happened, and we've now created the single largest horizontal platform for seed and early stage investing in the country. So if an entrepreneur wants to raise from about ten to $12,000 to seven, eight million, you can do it on a single platform. Just keep growing your business and pulling down money from one room to the other. And I think that to me is very, very important because Fundraising is, takes so much time. I mean, many of you in this room are entrepreneurs and you'll understand this and empathize this. We are trying to just crunch that fundraising time to as min little as possible, but not taking away the quality of money, not taking away the mentoring, not taking away the ability to create a global market access for our young companies because that's what they need. And I think this, all of this has come together again with a lot of policy making, a lot of tweaks, a lot of responsive um, and 
an initial proactive uh, policy making that has enabled us to happen. So in, in one sentence, if I wrap up India today from an investor's perspective, because our job is really to get married, get a divorce and get alimony, that's our job. I think it could be a better place to be in today. I think India is really rocking and we are enjoying ourselves and really making money as well. So I think, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> So I know that there are a lot of people in the room who are building ecosystems um, and your countries are not as advanced, right? And one of the things I think we need to point out is that one of the things that's differentiated the thinking of everybody on this stage today versus the old thinking is that everybody's taking a long-term approach. Nobody was looking to make quick returns. As, you, as she said, it's been 12 years for, in the journey. Um, if you do not have a long-term approach and you're expecting quick results, you're going to be very disappointed. When we started t -Hub, one of the things that we said was, we need to build something that will last for 20 years because that's what it takes to build an ecosystem. It's not five years, six years. Uh, and that, that approach needs to be there. And you have to look at the different pieces. So policy, infrastructure, investing, mentorship. And so India today is really thriving and, and changing. But Yatin, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you run co-working spaces on the ground. You've seen unicorns born in your living room, uh, literally. What's been the change for you over the last five, years, six years you've been running your spaces? So Srini, I would say uh, it's been 15 years, right, since the time I started my entrepreneurial journey. Uh, the word entrepreneurship never existed. No, uh, this buzzword of startups wasn't there. Uh, the ecosystem and the community which we talk about didn't exist. And that was my challenge when I was starting out of my living room uh, back in those days. Uh, from there on, uh, about six, seven years back, when I got into uh, supporting the ecosystem, I realized the Indian youngsters who were passing out of colleges were literally jobless. Uh, there were people who were starting up ventures, but they didn't know how to sustain those ventures. Uh, there was lack of infrastructure. There was lack, uh, the, uh, the cost of starting up was very high at that point of time. So if you wanted to access the infrastructure, it was super expensive. Uh, the doors were open only to people who were privileged. Uh, and uh, again, if you had basic education, you couldn't do much. I think that's the difference which we created uh, from the grassroots perspective, where uh, we picked up on some of the, uh, some of the, the international programs like Startup Weekends. Uh, we started uh, building uh, communities of people who were trying to, who were experimental, who were dropouts, but trying to do something on their own who were coming up with new ideas, but uh, couldn't find a market to validate it. So we said, hey, you know what? Let's put them in a room and let's see what happens. And while we put them in a room, let's provide them the best access at the most affordable price. I think that made uh, a significant difference uh, in the lives of a lot of people. Uh, we have success stories of unicorns starting out of my living room seven years back. Uh, so. Uh, these were the people who were trying hard to do something, but they didn't have the resources and the support uh, to take their ideas to the next level. Uh, so when when peer-to-peer -peer mentoring started happening, when everyone who was thinking in the same board started uh, sitting together in the same room, they started talking about their problems. They started accessing the pipeline of customers themselves. They started. Uh, they started working in a shared uh, economy concept where they started uh, figuring out the secretarial services, the HR services, the accounting services uh, from a single person. That allowed most of them to save costs, cut costs, uh, sort of uh, prolong their journey uh, without raising a lot of investments and validate their ideas to become, uh, to take it to the next level. And from there on, uh, I think what we have seen in the last five years, how the government uh, came uh, with a strong push to support entrepreneurship, how the investor community started reciprocating uh, to new ideas has sort of allowed uh, to bridge the gap between the grassroots communities and the uh, top level communities. And that's, that's the biggest strength which the country has at this point of time. Yeah, and I think if you're, if you're building um, any kind of an ecosystem, right, you actually need both sides of this. You need the top-down approach, which is how do you do capacity building? How do you make sure that everybody gets the resource they require, whatever that happens to be? But at the same time, you have to have the other side, which is focused on 
filtering them down, making sure that the top few become really successful. Uh, and you need both sides of those to happen together. Yeah. Uh, how much time do we have left? Five minutes. Five minutes? So I think maybe we could open up the floor for a couple of questions before we finish. Do we have microphones? We can hear you. Why don't you? No, yeah, you can just yeah, shout yeah, out. Yeah. There is mic. Can you speak to everyone? There is a microphone. Oh, Please it, stand and speak. It may throw the yeah. microphone. Oh, I think it's coming. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to GEC. Uh, I am really proud and uh, very happy to see all of you. I'm living in Bahrain for the past 24 years. I'm an entrepreneur. I've started a, a fintech company nine years before. So 10 years, I was a social worker. And then after putting the kids to uh, proper education, then I started my own company. And now, uh, for the past eight years, I've made around 400 clients in Bahrain itself. So very recently, we had been to Hyderabad. We had been awarded a full delegation. We were there in Hyderabad. So I was also one of the award holder. It's so happy to see all of you in one panel, especially in Bahrain. This is what we were looking for. And I wanted to ask a question. Uh, how to scale up the company being an Indian entrepreneur in uh, uh, away from India. So is there any possibility where government can support the Indians who are outside Bahrain, uh, outside India, who, who had already set up their company, the scaling up, uh, mentorship, or to go to the next level, this is one thing. And how we can also sell our products which we've already proved in the Bahrain market to bring it to India, where uh, uh, you had kindly expressed that government is ready to take the products to test it. So we have done uh, reconciliation, RPA products, chatbot, uh, artificial intelligence, and we have also done uh, machine learning classification of customers. So such products are already proved in the banks here in financial sectors in Bahrain. Now, how I can bring it? And as a proud feeling, bringing back our products to our own country. So these two areas, I need your advice and guidance. Thank you so much. Program. Which one? Want to take all the questions yeah, together? Yeah, we could do that. Um, and I think that's one of those questions. So, so the session is on building an ecosystem. So I'd, I'd like questions on the ecosystem side. Maybe we could take that one offline and, and talk about that. But I think depending on, yeah, we have several things that, are, that could help. There's you know, a bridge I think program. The question you, you know, generally, one of the things I'd like to share is, at the national level, there's a very clear message uh, to all federal agencies that data, once it is, you know, sanitized for security and privacy and other issues, data is the new wealth for, for any economy. And, you know, we really can build solutions, innovations around data. So whether you are in Bahrain or you are in Hyderabad, data is available. So India is committed to putting more and more data to, to drive the so as we say, India is the Saudi Arabia for data. You know, we've got, so that is one sector segment. Uh, you mentioned machine learning, AI, we're looking at uh, uh, industry 4.0. So there is a national artificial intelligence strategy paper up out there. So I think the ecosystem is well set in India for where, wherever you are to access the data and then, you know, pro uh, productize in India. And uh, we would encourage you to, you know, even uh, invest in India. So it's not about being, you know, so the FDI is the foreign direct investment. This is as good as a time, in fact, was never better. FDI is just pouring, and you see the figures, foreign direct investment is, is guaranteed, you know, massive returns are gonna come. The information pool is there, the challenges, social impact investing, it's, it's, it's an opportunities galore in India. That's the, uh, fine, but I think there was a question there. Uh, this side first. Hello. That one next. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I am feeling proud, and I must appreciate the government is working very good. I since last five years, I'm also uh, you know teaching entrepreneurship, and uh, the change we can see, you know, uh, young entrepreneurs are coming. The people are talking about entrepreneurship. And I feel very proud being an Indian that we are, we are, we are changing very fast. But you know, my concern is that still I feel that uh, you know, our ecosystem is largely uh, government driven. You know, as in private school people, we are also trying our best. But you know, the government is, why government has to come everywhere to push the things? Why we are not uh, you know, creating a 
environment, private people by themselves, like we people are coming, are yes, coming yes. and supporting this, uh, you know, uh, motion and movement for young entrepreneurs. That's my question. Can, can I you. take that? Yeah. Sure. Okay, let me take that one. Um, you know, I just mentioned that India's first in industry was the IT industry, right? And it was a first generation entrepreneurial industry. Other than the Tatas, everybody was first generation, right? And that is now pushing to be a $225 billion industry in what, 25, 30 years. Okay, the reason, and I, I have to say, I know I have people both in the audience and on the panel from the government, but that industry happened despite the government. Okay, and there are many anecdotes which I would not like to share on the dais, where the industry actually happened because the government was not interfering or not getting into the way. In fact, even at that time, the government was helping, but in a very, very muted way. Second, I think, if you look at today even, if you look at uh, the government's role, especially in angel investing, it is not dictating, it is not coming in the way. It's, become, it's an enabler, it's not running investments. It's not even utter innovation. I don't think it runs the incubators or no. the innovation labs or the tinkering labs. It's an enabler. And for a government, I think enabling and building infrastructure, building development e ecosystems, pushing, that is its role. So, so yes. We give a grant, we give about $2 million per incubator. Yeah. Clean grant. So everything they do is actually in partnership with private. So they're doing incubators with partners. They're it doing fund-to-funds with partners. It didn't, happen, it didn't partners. happen earlier. It's happening it now, and therefore you think yeah. it's... So, yeah. One person. He has the mic. Sorry, can't hear you. One second. Okay. Sorry, I tried. Yeah, there you um, this is really helpful stuff. What were some of the key catalysts or change agents that allowed you change the mindset of the investors, to go from folks who wanted to have something tangible like real estate, weren't comfortable with failure, had a very three-year point of view, to saying, you know what, I can see that seven to 10-year horizon. I'm willing to take this and invest. What were some things that helped you? Okay, so it's a very, very good question because changing mindsets is probably the most difficult thing. I think for... Uh, no, no, you go. She's talking about him. I was talking. So I think what I what we perceived as angel investment, which is a very high risk asset class, you're going to lose money is a given, right? I think for us, what worked is the first group of angels that came in and literally drove this entire wave of investing were first generation entrepreneurs themselves who had succeeded. So they were completely wedded to the idea of entrepreneurship. They had seen the wealth and value that they had created, both for themselves and people around them. They understood the arduous journey that they had gone through. They understood what kind of help could have, they could have done with, right? And there was a huge level of empathy and hand-holding. And for them, because they created their wealth from entrepreneurship, they didn't see themselves creating the similar wealth from real estate. Does that answer your question? But also, Padmaja, didn't you do a lot of uh, working with your angels to yeah, teach them yeah. about? Yeah, we do a lot of, we still do for that matter. That's right. We, ha we still do a lot of training of angels. We do a lot of uh, hand-holding, lead induction programs and all of that. That's number one. And number two, yes, we also had to do as angels, we also had to sort of curate the ecosystem. The first business plan competition in the country that we did, a national level, which was with the Economic Times, and Economic Times is the leading, uh, yeah, which is the leading um, uh, uh, publication in India. We got 37,000 business plans in 31 days, okay? And we did another one with Mr. Mathur when he was running from the Rajasthan government uh, organization. Mm. We got 45,000 business plans, right? We invested in a fraction of that, but what it did, it was, it just unleashed the mindset. It brought it right up there. So again, to your point, it's just not the government. I think the private or the non-government, if I should say, is also sort of helped uh, curate the ecosystem. I think we have time for one last question. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Joel from Botswana. Um, thank you very much for the uh, encouraging story about uh, India 
and the development of uh, ecosystem. Um, I just wanted to understand, uh, maybe I may have missed it, but the obstacles you overcame to be where you are. The, the <laughs> challenge that we, we have uh, is where those people uh, who are supposed to facilitate, government is supposed to facilitate. But when you come with a new system like that, you find a resistance within, within uh, uh, say, the government system to facilitate the investors. Why, how did you overcome uh, that problem? The second thing, when you come to dealing with finances, you talk angel invest, investment, uh, sometimes investors, instead of developing businesses, they divert the funds. Did you have problems like that? And how did you overcome if you had? But, but uh, let me tell you. you one thing, you know, see, uh, startups and the SME sector, sometimes we get confused about the two. There is absolutely no way that you can create this ecosystem without accessing cheap debt. You know, so nations will have to go through that pain point you will have to find out uh, debt, long-term debt, if possible, and then invest it to create the infrastructure. You have to roll out your connectivity so that a startup can, can you know, so the uh, economy and nation will have to access long-term funds to create the infrastructure on which the startups, the investors, the angels can invest. Angels won't invest if there is no background, if that infrastructure is not available. So economies will have to access debt also. So very often in these conversations, we don't talk about what I call venture debt. There will be debt which will, you know, go, uh, go, go non-performing. So the government will have to come in with financial institutions uh, which will extend debt. Padmaja was mentioning about the IT industry but some of the big wigs in the IT industry started not with equity. They all started with debt. And uh, uh, Infosys got its first loan from the Karnataka State Finance Corporation. You know, so, this, so the starting has to be done by some hand-holding by government developmental financial institutions to extend credit. So in India, we have a very large program called the Mudra so we have a national DFI, government has fully capitalized it, and we have given these small size loans to hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of, you know, small, very mom and pop stores, and you know, they've just got access to very cheap debt, and the default rates are not there. So I think your question was more about first ramping up the SME uh, ecosystem, whereafter some of them will move to equity. So it's impossible to expect every startup to, you know, everybody to get equity. It won't happen. So I think we've uh, run out of time. So I want to thank you all for being here for this session. Thank my panel members for uh, giving their valuable uh, suggestions and advice and talking thank about you. what they've done in the past. Thank you. Thank for you all. Us. Thank you. We have another very distinguished gentleman would like to speak. Uh, Mr. Gupta would have been on the panel, but I think the panel didn't have chairs. You want to share a little bit? Please, please, give him the mic. No, he's a very distinguished uh, professional. We should take a picture. Uh,